Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, friends of a free Venezuela. You are welcome. Today's event is dedicated to the Venezuelan people. Our thoughts and prayers go to honor the victims of the dictatorship that rules today in that country. I'm from Costa Rica, a small nation which for a long time was in the list of enemies of several dictatorships in Venezuela. I remember when in high school, planes dark in the skies and rain propaganda for Marcos Perez Jimenez, military dictator of Venezuela in the 1950s. Some samples I picked up attacked President Jose Figueres and former Venezuelan President Romulo Betancourt. At that point, Betancourt was living in Costa Rica because he sought asylum in uh, my country. Over those years, the political storms in Venezuela brought to San Jose a string of notable and wonderful professors who were exiled in my country. Uh, I had one professor from Venezuela in high school, a fantastic professor, Julio Groskos. I think he, uh, he, he stayed in, in Costa Rica. Then as a novel apprentice of journalism, I met Carlos Andres Perez and also Romulo Betancourt. He was not uh, meeting somebody very pleased to meet you, this, this, but I was able to talk to them over the years, over the uh, years or months that they were in my country. Time goes fast, but you didn't, you don't have to listen to my memories of times long ago. Unfortunately, we're not here to celebrate Venezuela's democracy. Instead, we're here to show our solidarity with Venezuela's suffering at the hands of a brutal dictator and the valiant struggle for freedom being waged in the streets of Caracas and all over the country by the oppressed Venezuelan people. Meanwhile, Maduro spends millions of dollars to pay lobbyists in Washington there are millions and millions and millions. We are proud of this uh, reunion here in the heart of the United States. Our speakers are a top sample of Venezuelan intellectuals, businessmen, and freedom fighters as well. The speakers will give us their ideas and any possible civil and democratic solution to the country in Venezuela. They will speak in this order. First, Gustavo Coronel, then Boris Saavedra, then Ruben Perina, and finally, Gabriela Febres Cordero. Their CVs appear in the programs. When all presentations are completed, we'll have a period of questions. My sincere thanks to Rachel Cox, our Director of Events, for all her efforts to make possible this conference. And I thank Dr. John Walters, Hudson's Vice President, for his crucial support to this series of conferences on Latin America. And without any further ado, I welcome Gustavo. You can speak either where you're seated or here. If you have, uh, you better come here, yeah. Well, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I would like uh, to, to start uh, my, uh, my talk with a one minute uh, video that uh, I hope works.
<coughs> this was prepared for the uh, popular referendum of uh, the last uh, July 16, uh, in which uh, more than 7 million Venezuelans went to vote. Uh, surprisingly, 4,400 Venezuelans voted in Washington. I didn't realize that we had so many Venezuelans in, in this area. Uh, I would like uh, to, to present some very simple slides that will guide my, my talk. Uh, of course, uh, they are just bullets so that you at least can see what uh, I want to say. I believe the Venezuelan dilemma today is a matter of either talking the talk or walking the walk. And I will try to, uh, to tell you where we are at uh, this moment. Venezuela is, is a country in ruins. Uh, if you want to buy some food, you will go to the market and you will not find very much to buy. If, uh, if, you, want, if you go to the drugstore in look, in looking for a prescription drug, uh, odds are that you will not find it. If you want to go to the movies, you better think twice, because uh, every year 26,000 Venezuelans die violently in the streets of uh, Caracas and other cities, uh, many of them actually at the hands of the Venezuelan police or the Venezuelan National Guard. Uh, a high percentage of uh, children are undernourished or roaming the streets uh, as abandoned children. Uh, the Venezuelan oil company is uh, practically bankrupt, uh, actually in a state of technical default. It does not pay the, their providers. Uh, more than one million Venezuelans are abroad. Actually, the, the referendum of the July 16 show that uh, 700,000 Venezuelans voted abroad. 25,000 Venezuelans cross the boundary into Colombia every day to buy food that they cannot find in Venezuela. And, and many of those 25,000 do not come back every day. So we have a, a mass immigration from Venezuela into neighboring countries. $300 billion, that's a very rough estimate, of course, $300 billion have been stolen from Venezuela during the last 18 years. Uh, as you can see, this has not happened overnight. This uh, deterioration of the Venezuelan life has come about in the last 18 years. And uh, in those 18 years, Venezuela has been a political satellite of Cuba. In the beginning, Fidel tutored Chavez, and now Raul tutors Maduro. But we are basically in the hands of Cuba as far as political decisions are concerned. About 15,000 military, Cuban military personnel are in, Cuba, are in Venezuela today, giving orders and uh, taking into their hands uh, decisions which should be done or made by Venezuelans. The country has gone from being a petro state for many years to being now a narco state. And this has been done with the help of the army. The army actually runs the four main criminal businesses in Venezuela. They run the drug traffic. They run the contraband of gasoline and diesel oil from Venezuela into Colombia and Brazil. They run the food distribution system uh, through which he, they make immense profits. And they even have a, a, an oil company. Uh, they have an oil company, and of course, they have no knowledge whatsoever of oil, but uh, they contract uh, with the companies that do, do the work, and they collect uh, uh, kickbacks from PDVSA. So the, the army is an integral, integral component of the narco state in Venezuela. Now, the closing of all doors to electoral events, uh, 
that should have been done already last year and this year have led in Venezuela to an open civic rebellion. Venezuela is, I would say, almost in a state of asymmetrical civil war because, of course, uh, the population has no weapons, but they have managed to build uh, or to manufacture homemade uh, bombs or whatever you want to call them, but they are in a to total state of uh, in, 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 uh, defenseless uh, as related to the, to the armed forces in, in Venezuela. At the last count, about 110 Venezuelans have died in the protests. About 400 Venezuelans are being tried today in military courts, although they are civilians. About 1,000 Venezuelans are in prison as a result of these protests. They are marching. Today, they have, a four, they have started a 48-hour stoppage in all, of, over the, all over the country. And, uh, and in fact, this uh, is an all-out civic rebellion, not too different from uh, uh, French-style revolution uh, in, in the sense of popular mass movement. It's no longer a middle-class rebellion. It, it, it cuts across social, social strata. Oops. As I said before, a popular referendum brought one, uh, one, uh, seven, over seven million Venezuelans voting against the government, uh, calling for the support, institutional support of the armed forces and calling for the creation of a parallel government in Venezuela. Uh, parallel government uh, meaning a, a new tribunal of justice, a new electoral council, and a new uh, uh, citizen's uh, power. They call it poder, uh, poder ciudadano. And uh, in, this, uh, in these days, however, in parallel with this popular referendum, the regime, Maduro, has insisted in convoking a constituent assembly. A constituent assembly, by definition, would be supraconstitutional. It would have the power to rewrite the constitution, to remove all public employees, to name different public employees in Venezuela. In, to in, in practice, they would have in their hands complete a political control of the country. And uh, if they do this, then uh, the, uh, the narco state would become a communist narco state. While this uh, rebellion is going on and while Maduro is convoking his constituent assembly, some Venezuelans in Venezuela and some leaders abroad have been what I would call talking the talk. That is to say they are making sounds, but they are not taking much action. Uh, included in this group with all their good intentions are the Pope, uh, the Obama administration, the international diplomatic community, that they have uh, a beautiful diplomatic language, which consists uh, in promising many things, but doing ve very, very little. And uh, in fact, this, uh, this, uh, group, uh, this group of leaders is uh, reinforced uh, by Venezuelan groups which are asking today for, a, a, for an understanding with the, with the Maduro regime. Uh, let's sit together, you know, like uh, Venezuelans. We are all Venezuelans. We are brothers. And we should reach some conclusion as to how to form a transition government that would be made up of you guys and we so that we can uh, slowly drift uh, peacefully into democracy. Of course, uh, the, this has some merits. Uh, I personally do not believe in this kind of, of uh, negotiation. But uh, 
many leaders in Venezuela or several important leaders in Venezuela are advocating uh, such a, a solution for Venezuela, a negotiation. And uh, so our current dilemma, uh, the country seems to be rather split, uh, not equally, of course, but split into people who want to negotiate with the Venezuelan regime and those who want to continue in rebellion until the Maduro regime collapses definitely. Actually, uh, in parallel to this, some countries like the ALBA countries, uh, Cuba, Nicaragua, uh, Bolivia, and so on, and the Petrocaribe members, which have been receiving a lot of oil from Venezuela in the last uh, few years, they oppose any sanctions in the OAS against Venezuela. So we have a very uh, strong group of countries uh, lobbying in favor of the Maduro regime abroad and a group of important Venezuelan leaders calling for a negotiation with the Maduro regime. Fortunately, I say fortunately, uh, some uh, 20 countries in the region, led by Canada and Mexico, are taking a, a more positive or a stronger uh, position regarding the Maduro regime in uh, OAS, in the OAS. And today, of course, the OAS is meeting in order to try once again to, uh, to act uh, regarding the, the Venezuelan situation. For example, uh, Almagro just uh, published his third uh, report on Venezuela, which very clearly says uh, all members of the Venezuelan regime are equally responsible for the crimes which are taking place in, in Venezuela. Uh, the electoral system in Venezuela is the key component of the deterioration of institution, democratic institutions in Venezuela. Uh, he, he has been very forceful in condemning the Maduro regime. So we are now uh, facing what to do next. What I have here is just what I think we should do next. Of course, there are all kinds of uh, opinions regarding what we should be doing next. In the first place, I believe the governments of the region have more than ample information already to retire the diplomatic recognition of the Maduro regime. Uh, there, there, there is no doubt the Maduro regime is totally anti-constitutional, is illegal, it has lost legitimacy. The U.S. should apply individual sanctions to the many members of the regime which violate, who violate uh, human rights and, and who uh, incur in acts of uh, political corruption. But I, I also proposed, or I also favor, uh, sanctions against uh, the imports of Venezuelan oil into the United States. This is a much more controversial subject, and there are many respectable Venezuelans who do not agree with that, because they claim that uh, the Venezuelan people would be the one to suffer. I say that uh, the suffering of the Venezuelan people right now can hardly be greater, no matter what we, what actions are being taken by the United States. Uh, the, 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 the way they, they are behaving uh, for example, they are getting the, the, the money from the United States for, for the oil, and rather than putting this money into improving the Venezuelan situation, they pay their debt of bonds, except that the bonds are largely in the, ho in the hands of their own people. Uh, some of the largest holders of Venezuelan bonds are the, the members of the Venezuelan government. So in fact, uh, what is going on is a transfer of money from the U.S. into the hands of the Venezuelan, into the members of the Venezuelan regime. I believe that extreme political pressure should be applied to Cuba, because Cuba is the key to the Venezuelan decision-making. Uh, Castro has to be pressured into telling Maduro, 
we have come to the end of this thing. Uh, we, we, there is no longer any future in keeping up the pretense of a socialistic regime in, in Venezuela. And what is going to happen in the next few days? Uh, I still have a feeling, instinctive feeling, that Maduro is going to go on national uh, cadena and retire his proposal for a constituent assembly, which is a grotesque mistake because uh, he already knows that that assembly would be controlled by Cabello, who is his main opposition. And then he himself would be the victim of the Frankenstein that he has uh, created. I, I have a feeling that he will do that. But uh, if, if he doesn't do that, then the Venezuelan uh, side, the democratic Venezuelans, are planning a national strike of indefinite length. And they are also creating a parallel government that would force the governments abroad to decide which government in Venezuela are we going to, to recognize. So uh, Venezuelans are now walking the walk. And I believe that for the international community, it's time also to walk the walk rather than, than keeping talking the talk. Thank you. Good morning. Happy to be here. Um, I have the honor and privilege to be here with you and share some ideas. What is the specific role of the military in the current situation in Venezuela? But before that, I'd like to express my thanks to the Hudson Institute and particularly to Jaime Darenblom for this opportunity to participate in this event and try to explain a little bit what is going on um, with the military in Venezuela. But I'd like to begin, says, as a Venezuelan-American, I need to put this, because everything that I'm going to say here is my own responsibility. And it's based in my 34 years in the armed forces of Venezuela and the continuing analysis of the situation in Venezuela for these 18 years. And this is part of the policy of the William J. Perry Center where I work at National Defense University. This is the agenda I prepare for 15 minutes. And then I will talk a little bit about the role of the military in Venezuela today, which is quite different than the role played by the military back in the last century when I was there. Uh, the operational context of the military in Venezuela and the component of the military, how I do the analysis of any military forces in the world through three components that I will explain how these components work in the case of Venezuela. And I will give you the potential scenario that I see in the short term. But you can read this, but here is my case. The armed forces of Venezuela has been transformed in debt, affecting the organizational structure of the military. During 18 years, the current government in Venezuela has developed a military policy of politicization of the military, changes in the legal framework and capabilities. Today, the armed forces in Venezuela have not been seen as a regular armed forces in a democratic country. Because the 
Armed Forces of Venezuela are part of the PSUV, which is the ruling political party in Venezuela, involved in domestic politics and other government functions other than the security and defense of the homeland. They are in charge of the whole government function. In the last 18 years, applying populist policies with demagogy and corruption. Today, Venezuela is the most corrupt country in the Western Hemisphere, with the armed forces involved in drug trafficking, human rights violation, and reading its capability depleted. And I will do my analysis based in these three elements that I'm going to explain to you. The historical factor. The origin of, of today our forces in Venezuela have nothing to do with the troops commanded by Simon Bolivar in the 19th century. Let's be clear. The armed forces of today in Venezuela has been reinstitutionalized in the at the early days of the 20th century but Juan Vicente Gomez who was the dictator in Venezuela for 27 years and that's our forces were created and reinstitutionalized based in the Praetorian activity of the military just to save that government that governed in Venezuela for 27 years. Because some people ask you, how come the Simon Bolivar, his troop that command forces in South America, liberating Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, all these countries, because the armed forces in Venezuela today have nothing to do with this. It's a, a point that I want to make historically. And one thing that we need to know why that happened is because we have a civil war in the 19th century. And after this civil war, our country was destroyed. And governments had the war to utilize all the elements to get a government function. Because the country after the war was divided and he came many years after that, with another revolution, with another constitution, just to try to govern the country. And he tried, and he governed, you know, very tough, 27 years. The other thing I want to explain with this triangle, when you analyze any armed forces in any part of the world, there are three major elements. The first element, or one of those is the legal framework. And then you have the nature and the other element is the capabilities to analyze how that armed institution work, how they do what they do, how they perform their own work. What happened in the case of Venezuela with the government that came in 1999, they start transforming the armed forces of Venezuela major transformation. And that transformation start what? Changing the law, the military law. Obviously, they changed first the constitution. And the constitution remained, you know, like a, any democratic constitution where the armed forces in charge of the defense and security of the country. However, they start making changes unconstitutional changes to the military to control the military, to change the nature, because the nature of the military is the origin, the reason why you have armed forces. This is the nature. To protect and defend the country, yes. But they start changing that role in the country. Not because the armed forces will not defend the, the country in the case of war, no. But they establish another role, an internal role. And that's the reason why you see, for so many years, you have so many officers in 
public office, doing everything. I remember back in 2012, we have more than 350 military officers in government controlling finances, controlling health, controlling logistics, controlling everything in the country. And that happened. They changed the law that affect the nature because the military, what happened, affect the capability. And I remember when President Chavez said so many years ago, and he said he sent the troops to the borders with the tanks and everything. To do what? Because we are going to have a major conflict with Colombia. I tell you what, in that time, the readiness capability of the military in Venezuela was so low. Not even the tank, not even all the tank approach the border. And how you are going to use the tank in the border between Venezuela and Colombia, particularly in the, uh, in the west? It's a big mountains over there, the Indian region. You can use this probably in the south with the plain land. But at the same time, this is a plain land with a lot of water. You cannot use it. And then you can ask me why Venezuela need a tank. Well, the same reason why Nicaragua got tanks from Russia last year. Why we spend that money? Well, we spend a lot of money, you know, buying things that we will never be able to use. But in the case of Venezuela particularly, and then you see they change the law, they affect the nature, they affect the capability, but they affect how they affect the mind of the officer because they change all the curriculum in the military academies. And that has been changed. In my opinion, in order to be able to reestablish the military as a military for full dedication to the military activity, we will need generations. Because you can change the tank, you can check the airplanes, the frag gate is easy. You can buy new ones if you want to. But how you change the mentality? I remember on July the 9th when one of the new officers graduated, giving an speech. When I when I read that speech, I say, it, that this officer could be a military just because he had the uniform. I was a political remarks. He was talking about as a politician, talking about the uh, the party, the revolution, and the military supposed to be, by the Constitution, a political, away from politics. But that's not the case in the, the Venezuela. And then I want to finish, because I want to give time for Q&A, and then we can explain a little more. And this is the scenario I see. In the, in the first one, with constituent assembly suspended or not, this is what I see. The opposition will continue to raise protests in the street. The military win, probably, because the military is so divided inside. You can find easy three major blocks. You can find what they call the institutional military that believe in the democracy, believe in the constitution and the rule of law. You find another ones that I call Nini. They do nothing. They stay quiet to see what is going to happen and then take decisions. And you have the other ones affected, absorbed by politics, ruling the institution, involved in drug trafficking, in human rights violations. And this is scenario number one. And the scenario number two, and this is going to be probably from next Monday on, I see with the Constitutional Assembly is the protest in the country will continue because even if we don't have the event next Sunday, the people will continue doing demonstration because the demonstration is not just for the student assembly. 
It's more than that. The people is fighting in the street for freedom, for democracy, which is different. Until this government don't get out by the rules, by the political means, out of the power, the people will not stop. And the military probably will be involved um, in, the, in the way of they will decide, part of the military will decide to say, okay, I will do nothing, I will not participate in this because it's unconstitutional. But that will not stop the people in the street. Now, the, the people will stop going to the street when the moment they see that the, uh, the current government get back to the constitution, call for the elections, and the people see the light in the horizon. But in this two scenario, and I highlight at the end, you can see it's two major elements the military internally, and the U.S. outside. Why the U.S.? Simple. 90, over 95% of the income in Venezuela is what they receive from the United States for oil. And if the uh, United States decide to finish that uh, commercial activity with Venezuela, that will be hard that the current government can continue in power. And I think, uh, but there's a lot of things involved in this beyond the military activities. Because when you go to oil, you need to see Citgo in the, in the United States, and 49% of Citgo today belong to Reznov, which is the Russian company. When we call in this country today Russia, well, oh my God. Well, but the, look, the dimension of this problem, because the problem in Venezuela is not just isolated problem just in Venezuela. It's not just in the Western Hemisphere. It's a global effect, and we need to be aware of that. I will stop my comments, and I will be open and happy to answer you any question that you may have in the Q&A period. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's good to see some familiar faces here. It's, um, it's a pleasure to participate in this panel uh, full with uh, interesting uh, uh, speakers, um, all Venezuelans. I am not a Venezuelan, so <laughs> you have to forgive me some, uh, some mistakes if I make them. <clears throat> uh, my, um, the topic of, uh, well, first of all, I'd like to, uh, to thank Ambassador um, Darren Bloom for the invitation. Uh, the topic of my presentation is, is about the OAS and, um, and, the inter, and its Inter-American Democratic Charter and, and its application to the Venezuelan case. <clears throat> it has, the presentation has three parts. One is uh, it's a, bit, a little bit of a, a background on, on the Democratic Charter. Uh, two, uh, it, will be, it will touch on uh, Second part will touch on, on development, recent developments, and uh, on, in, in its application to the Venezuelan case. And thirdly, um, I will deal a little bit with what the new pressures, what new pressures can be put on um, <clears throat> the Maduro regime, uh, particularly to cancel the Constituent uh, Assembly. So one one of the strengths of the OAS is that um, it it has its very own instrument to promote and defend democracy. That is, it has its own democratic, inter-American democratic charter, which was adopted unanimously in 2001. The charter embodies an, an, uh, an unprecedented historic consensus and commitment uh, by the member states uh, to collectively promote uh, and defend democracy whenever it is threatened or interrupted in one of the member states. Uh, the charter is, uh, it's, it's good to, to understand that the charter is, is, uh, is, is the result of a historical process. Mm -hmm. 
to protect democracy, a process that that uh, began in the early 1980s as most of the countries returned to democracy in the hemisphere, to democratic governance. And this was reflected in changes made to the OAS Charter uh, when a uh, member state established that one of the basic fundamental purposes of the organization is the, uh, the promotion of democracy, representative democracy at that. In, uh, <clears throat> in the Democratic Charter of 2001, the member states went, went a little bit farther and convened, first of all, that the people of the Americas have the right to democracy and the government's the, the obligation hmm, to protect it, to promote it, and defend it. Secondly, and without precedence, they also approved that in the event of an unconstitutional uh, alteration of the democratic uh, order in one of its members, the Secretary General or any member state may convene the Permanent Council to undertake a collective assessment of the situation and then take the uh, decisions or actions that they deem appropriate. In principle, uh, this means that, that um, member states may impose collective or individual sanctions, diplomatic, economic, commercial, etc., against the transgressor, including the extreme measure of suspending that country from the organization. Uh, in the Venezuelan case, however, this is uh, uh, a mute point because Maduro already has uh, withdrawn the, uh, uh, the country from the organization. But let me let me now briefly review recent developments related to the to the application of the of the charter to the to Venezuela. The OAS involvement uh, in the Venezuelan crisis began in May of last year. Uh, when the Secretary General uh, sent his devastated uh, report on the Venezuelan situation to the Permanent Council of the OAS, invoking the Democratic Charter uh, and, and asked for a, for a meeting to, to present it. The report, uh, as you probably remember, remember uh, uh, left no doubts that Maduro, that the Maduro regime had altered the constitutional democratic order and that the country was undergoing dramatic economic and humanitarian crisis. With this action, the Secretary General uh, put the Venezuelan situation, for, and this is significant, the Venezuelan situation uh, on the Permanent Council agenda, something which had not happened before. However, to the disappointment of many, the meeting uh, of June 23rd of last year convened to hear his report, did not proceed to discuss it and ended without a declaration or a resolution because of the lack of consensus or a majority uh, among the member states. Uh, but the mere fact, the mere fact that the Permanent Council met to hear it signified that the Charter had been activated. At that time, several member states still believe that the mediation process uh, being carried out by, the, by uh, Rodriguez Zapatero, Leonel Fernandez, and Martin Torrijos had a chance, hmm? and, 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 and it needed more time to succeed. By the end of the year, however, the, the recall referendum was successfully obstructed by the government, and the, mediator, and the mediating effort had failed. It was obvious to everyone. So given that, in March of this year, the Secretary General updated his report, pointing out that violence and repression had increased and that the humanitarian and, and human rights situation had worsened. Similarly, several states, between, 20, between 14 and 20 of them, a group, um, in a group declaration, inside or outside the organization, had expressed their, their growing concern for the Venezuelan situation and began to demand, each time with more resolve, uh, the release of uh, political prisoners, the calling of elections, the recognition, the recognition and restoration of the uh, of the uh, national assembly's powers, and the opening of a humanitarian channel. To aggravate matters, um, on April 1st, the Venezuelan Supreme Court, in an unusual uh, move, uh, decided unconstitutionally to assume legislative powers. Uh, this did not only provoke the condemnation of, um, uh, of most member states, but also triggered a call 
by 20 member states and the Secretary General for an urgent Permanent Council meeting. Despite the fact that the that the Supreme Court retracted some of the some of its decisions um, uh, because of the abroad of the international community, the Maduro government could not prevent, and tried it did, uh, the holding of the Permanent Council meeting of April third. Uh, neither could the regime and its allies uh, avoid the approval of the resolution, which expressed its profound concern for the grave unconstitutional alteration of democratic order in Venezuela and called for its government to ensure its complete restoration. This resolution was historic at the OAS of major significance. First, because uh, as it had not been done before, uh, refu the countries refused to do it before, they confirmed, this resolution confirmed that an alteration of the democratic order had taken place in Venezuela. And second, for the first time, a majority of member states had activated the democratic charter. Against the, and this is significant, against a, the government of one of its members that had altered the democratic order, not just uh, taken power by a coup, hmm? as it had been traditionally the case. Of course, the Venezuelan delegation and its allies opposed the resolution, arguing that it violated the principle of non-intervention and its, uh, its uh, it, and the sovereignty of Venezuela. And in many, as, as in many other occasions, the Permanent Council had to endure the strident, insolent, and undiplomatic behavior of the Venezuelan delegation, which insulted the Secretary General, berated the organization, and called the member states supporting the resolution lackeys and lapdogs of the U.S. government. The Mexican delegation, however, warned Venezuela and its allies that no one, that, uh, that one can no longer uh, use the principle of non-intervention to hide <coughs> alteration of democratic, the alteration of democratic government order and the violations of human rights. More recently, as we know, the situation has worsened. As some of our previous uh, speakers uh, mentioned, there are now more than uh, close to 100 dead uh, protesters more than a thousand injured, close to 500 detained, <clears throat> and more than 500, 450 pr prosecuted in military courts. In view of this growing violence and rep repression and humanitarian crisis, on April 26, a majority of member states called for the per called a new permanent council meeting, but this time, this time to decide <clears throat> on a date for a meeting of consultation of foreign minister. This is rather uh, unusual, mm -hmm. uh, unique. And this despite, once again, the opposition of the, uh, the strident, furious opposition of the Venezuelan government and its allies. allies. <clears throat> um, to make things worse, uh, on May 1st, Maduro announced uh, the, uh, the, the convening of the fraudulent constitutional convention to modify the constitution and to change the, the system of government into one that would make it much more easier to control the polity and to remain in power, similar to the communist regime in Cuba. Essentially, this is a move to avoid elections, which the regime knows it cannot win anymore. So the foreign ministers met twice, once here in Washington, D.C., and then in Cancun in, uh, on, on June 19. However, again, and to the disappointment of many of us in the democratic community, the meeting could not reach consensus, or nor a majority of 23 delegations based uh, 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 for a declaration based, on, uh, based on, on, uh, on a proposal by the group of 14, even though it had been negotiated with the Caribbean group. Only 20 member states voted for it. That is, the group of 14 plus Bahamas, Barbados, Belize, Guyana, Jamaica, and St. Lucia. Seven other Caribbean countries did not, <clears throat> along with Bolivia, Ecuador, Haiti, Nicaragua, and Dominican Republic. They all opposed uh, or abstained because of uh, ideological reasons or because of the pressure or, if not extortion, of the, gov of the Venezuelan government. But they all claimed that 
the proposed declaration violated the principle of non-intervention and the sovereignty of Venezuela. Nevertheless, and this is important again, at the conclusion of both meetings, the group of 14, and this group of 14 is, is significant uh, to, to understand that the, the compos its compositions, Argentina, Brazil, Canada, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Estados Unidos, the United States, Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, Panama, Paraguay, Peru, and Uruguay. This, this group of 14 uh, produces stern communique based on their proposed uh, but not adopted declaration. The communique expressed their deep concern for the rupture of democratic uh, order and the worsening of humanitarian crisis and called for an end to human rights violations, arbitrary detentions, tried by the military courts, and violence against peaceful demonstrators. It also demanded the restoration of the National Assembly's power, the release of political prisoners, the establishment of an electoral calendar, the opening of a humanitarian channel, and the cancellation of the Constitutional Convention. This was the most uh, controversial uh, feature of this declaration. It offered as well to provide humanitarian assistance and to form a group of member states to facilitate a renewed dialogue and negotiation. But with a, surprise, with a surprising release from prison of Leopoldo Lopez on July 8, the regime pretended to reduce the internal pressure from street demonstrations, social media, and from the international community. But instead, the pressure has intensified. With the plebiscite of July 16 that rejected the Constitutional Assembly, and with recent massive national strikes. Moreover, um, Argentina countries, the, the group of 14 has again uh, uh, renewed their call on Maduro to cancel it. And so have uh, the, 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 the European Union, Spain, France, Germany, and others. <clears throat> the, the growing violence and humanitarian crisis has compelled the Secretary General to produce another report, the third report, uh, and has called for an extraordinary meeting of the Permanent Council to consider the, uh, the critical situation. The meeting is taking place as we speak. I'm sorry, we have to miss it. He has also put out a new, uh, the, this report, the, this report that he just put out also, third report, is uh, uh, condemns condemns the, the, uh, uh, the increased repression and the violation of constitutional order. <clears throat> but the group of 14, however, appears a little bit reluctant to go along with, this, with the Secretary General call for the new meeting. Why? Well, simply because they don't, they don't feel, uh, they, are, uh, they, don't feel they, they have doubts about the existence of the majority of the even 18 votes to approve a resolution. Okay, so, but nevertheless, we, we have now two forces within the OAS hmm, that are pressuring for the restoration of democracy and for an end to repression and tyranny and for an easing of the humanitarian crisis. On the one hand, we have a very courageous Secretary General, uh, a Secretary General who for the first time for the first time, at least in my many years of career at the OAS, openly criticizes and denounces in clear terms the government of a member state. Almagro has effectively used his limited powers to put the Venezuelan issue on the table, as I said before, and has thus elevated the image and relevance of the OAS in the defense of democracy. He has moved the OAS from irrelevance to the front and center of the international effort to help save democracy in, the, in, in Venezuela. However, his public protagonism and kind of a sort of go alone attitude uh, it has not been appreciated by many ambassadors uh, of the member states. On the other hand, we have for the first time about 14, 18 states, those 14, the, the group of 14, that are willing, to in, are willing to invoke the Charter and are actively denouncing the Maduro government, calling for the cancellation of the Constitutional Assembly and pressuring for effective negotiations uh, with international facilitation that would find an immediate solution. But these two forces, these two forces have to work in harmony within the organization. The Secretary General courageous voice, valiant voice by itself, Despite its forcefulness and, and impact, it's not enough. 
it's not enough to mobilize the organization as a multilateral entity to take effective collective action against the dictatorial government. Only member states can decide on collective actions, not the Secretary General. The Secretary General cannot dictate their course of action. So, <clears throat> um, so what are the different options now member states have to increase pressure on the regime to restore democracy in Venezuela? What are the options? Most member states have different options, inside or outside of the OAS, individually or collectively. These are the options. Particularly after uh, the, the plebiscite, I believe it is, the time is right to keep pressure in the regime and to show solidarity uh, with the opposition and the young demonstrators uh, who risk their, life, their lives every day in, on the streets in Venezuela against an overwhelming force and repression. In short, in the short run, the objective should be to prevent the holding of the Constituent Assembly hmm, and have the regime accept the G14 demands. So, here are three alternative pathways. Uh, to keep the pressure on. One, within the OAS, the group of 14 should make every possible diplomatic, collective or individual effort to persuade at least the occasional Caribbean allies like Bahamas, Barbados, Jamaican, St. Lucia, to join it and form a majority in the, in the permanent council uh, <clears throat> called by the Secretary General and approve a resolution similar to the ones proposed in, 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 in Cancun. However, and this is my fear, that, uh, that this will inevitably conclude with a renewed dialogue, a, a call for renewed dialogue and negotiations. And negotiations which the government, we know the government ma manipulated and, and sabotaged in the past to avoid elections. But this time I think the negotiations should be facilitated by a balanced, impartial group, not by the three ex-presidents. And the agenda should be about how and when to cancel the Constitutional Assembly, to free political prisoners, to, to restore the power of the National Assembly, to respect human rights and the role of the general prosecutor, prosecutor to end repression and the military courts for civility, and to allow humanitarian assistance and to hold, hold general elections or a referendum. Elections, <clears throat> I'm sorry to, to say, um, uh, are the only logical and, and, and democratic solution to the crisis. But I suspect, and this is, I'm sorry to say, that it will not be accepted by the regime because it is suicidal. Its leaders know they will lose badly and will have to face criminal charges for abuses and crimes they have committed. Unless negotiations, negotiations of course, uh, include immunity and safe passage to, I don't know, Havana or Siberia. Another possible path is a more radical one. <clears throat> the G14 could increase pressure by moving to a new, more forceful stance against Maduro. <clears throat> one that would notify the Maduro government that if failing to cancel the, Consti the Constituent Assembly, it will seek to adopt individual or collective sanctions. In principle, uh, the Permanent Council could authorize member states to adopt collectively or individually punitive measures, including sanctions. We, we, all, we remember, must remember that suspending a non-democratic government, the ultimate sanction, is already allowed by the charter of the organization. But it is improbable that member states would approve such a resolution. So in that case, a third option is to uh, we have a third option, and that is to act outside of the institutional uh, framework of the organization. Member states collectively or individually within their sovereign rights could adopt certain measures designed to pressure or induce Maduro to move in the direction of the Group of 14's demands, as some countries have already done. Among the possible collective or individual sanctions, we have, for example, the recalling of ambassadors. Some countries have done that already the suspension of diplomatic relations, the non-recognition of the government, the expulsion of diplomatic and military attaches, and an arms embargo, including uh, 
uh, embargo of repressive equipment. Uh, Brazil has done that already. The suspension of exports, obviously excluding uh, food and, and medicine. Uh, the reduction or suspension of oil imports. The suspension of debt payments. The freezing of assets owned by individuals of the regime, uh, belonging to the, to the regime, as the United States has done with the Vice President already, uh, with the Venezuelan Vice President and the Supreme Court members, and the suspension of credits, investment projects, or uh, uh, cooperation programs. So, these are the possible ways for the international community to keep the pressure on if the regime does not cancel the Constituent Assembly. So, let me finish then by saying that the alternative to these uh, options is to do nothing, to remain pa uh, paralyzed by the lack of consensus and majority, or majority, in which case the OAS will be perceived again as a failure or useless and irrelevant to the solution of the Venezuelan crisis. Thank you for listening. Thank you for the invitation. I'm not sure. Yeah, this is working. Okay. Uh, thank you for the invitation, and it's a privilege to be here tonight. And also, I salute all my uh, colleagues here in the um, in the panel. Um, the the great thing to be the last one to speak is that you really got to shorten your original speech because everything else has been said. So, and the, and the, that's a good thing. And the bad thing is that it becomes a challenge to. Uh, come up with uh, new reflections or new thoughts on what has been said. So I'm going to try to do my best in the 10 minutes that I that I have at this time, trying to build up a little bit, not only on what I had prepared, but following up with uh, what my colleagues have uh, have expressed. And um, I, I would start first um, talking about the event on next Sunday, the uh, the election, um, the fragile and uh, election for the uh, the fraudulent uh, constitutional assembly um, I spent a little bit of a time in the last weeks trying to understand the way this voting and the polling was going to be done and I found two or three things that I thought were um, interesting um, worrisome and I really could not come up to a conclusion the first thing is that you vote not with your ID card, but you vote with a special a new ID that was issued about a year ago called Carnet de la Patria, which is an ID, um, fatherland, homeland uh, um, ID that was issued by the government uh, to the Venezuelans who wanted to access to food at sort of like a discount and who wanted to... Uh, keep their mortgage, if they had uh, special uh, payments on their mortgage for their homes, or they wanted to buy cars, whatever was any, any of the staples that the government could give to the Venezuelans, for them to enjoy that, they had to get this new ID, which would uh, practically would substitute the regular uh, Venezuelan ID, what we call cédula de identidad. When you look at that ID, it has a barcode, it has a name in the front, and then in the back it's got two numbers. One is called um, serial number, and the other one is called code number. And you look at those numbers, and somebody thought and occurred to them to feed that number into the electoral register. And what comes up is that two names, two voters appear in the code and in the serial. So, for instance, I did it, I myself, I did it with two of those, um, I don't have one of those Carnet de la Patria, but uh, I, I knew people that had it, and, uh, and I went to the webpage of the Consejo Nacional Electoral, the, the electoral body, and looked into this and fit in the, uh, the numbers, and the names came of two people, one living 
in uh, in San Felipe, the other one living in uh, in uh, El Tigre, um, small towns in Venezuela. And you think, well, wait a minute, why does this why does this uh, ID holds in the information of two people that vote in specific areas that are registered in that ID that supposedly is owned by uh, that person. Does that mean that each vote on Sunday, it's going to be one for three? Or what's the reason why that information is there? I have no answer, but I worry. I worry because the trend that we have seen on along in the last 17 years is uh, deceiving, is, uh, is unethical, and it's using any means of power in order to uh, preserve uh, power in the, in the government. So um, I would think that given that the government says they have issued 14 million uh, Carnet de la Patria, this new ID, and for some reason, those two names that appear in each one of those IDs will probably multiply and it would be exponential, the number of votes, perhaps. I would think that it's difficult that that event will be canceled or suspended next Sunday. I think they're going to go through uh, with, with, uh, with that initiative. And that initiative obviously is, and I'll pick up something that Gustavo said, is the Cubans behind. This is all Cuban technology, Cuban thought, Cuban um, um, way of, of proceeding in order to control the population. Um, so probably the outcome is going to be 8 million, 10 million that voted, that agreed into this, this voting process. Basically, you go, you don't vote. Just by the moment that you show your ID and the barcode goes through and you put your fingerprint, basically, that's it. You have, you have, you have agreed to this um, fraudulent assembly. So I would think that probably uh, they will hold it on Sunday and then on Monday or Tuesday when the new assembly will have to go into the legislative body, the building, and sit there and remove the old uh, Congress or the old uh, uh, National Assembly, the current one, the one that was elected on uh, on uh, 19, um, 2015 in December, there's going to be a lot of rioting and there's going to be a lot of civil unrest uh, that would escalate much higher than we have seen before. And then um, that comes to the scenarios that um, yesterday I saw in the Spanish paper and then uh, Andres Oppenheimer also came up with, uh, with some scenarios um, that um, there, would, there would be three possible scenarios short term um, in light of what's happening. It's very fluid, the situation every day. There's a new story, so every day the scenario changes a little bit. Felipe Gonzalez said that um, there were three possible short-term scenarios for Venezuela. One, that Maduro cancels the fraudulent constitutional assembly election, frees political prisoners, and agrees to hold general elections. Well, we, I personally don't think that that's possible. The uh, number two scenario is that uh, Maduro persists in holding the fraudulent assembly election, impacts the national assembly with his people, his cronies. And the third one, that the armed forces intervene and force Maduro to comply with the Venezuela's constitutional chart. Andres Oppenheimer, he said, um, similar to uh, Felipe Gonzalez, basically saying that scenarios would be Nicaragua, Cuba, or Syria, uh, which pretty much is what uh, Felipe Gonzalez has, has um, um, implied into this. Um, I would think that what's happening in Venezuela is out of the box, not in the books. I think it's it's uh, it's uncharted waters. I think it's very unusual when you see the the different uh, um, actors in in this uh, scenario, and, and and I think that none of those scenarios would really fit what we're seeing in Venezuela. At this point, I think that perhaps it would be a fourth scenario, and it's it's very. Um, um, it's an adventure on my side to speculate into this, but I would think that um, if the ones that controlled um, Venezuela, 
which basically are the Cubans in a, in a large, to a large extent, and the military are uh, submissive to the Cubans. Um, I think that we would have to look what is the Cuban interest in staying or leaving or keeping the status quo in Venezuela. And, um, and that would take us to look at um, what's happening with the oil supply. And um, I did a little bit of research on that, and I've got all that information, the things that I found. But um, besides that occupation that uh, Secretary General talks about, um, Cuba in Venezuela, he mentions 15,000 um, Cubans. I, Chavez, at one point, he, he mentioned it was 40,000, and probably there should be much more than that. At this point, all of that is in order to control uh, not only Venezuela, but the sources, the richest uh, sources of Venezuela, which is the oil. And then when you look that um, last year, as of October or November last year, and during eight months, Venezuela was unable to ship any oil to Cuba. Then you start thinking that Cubans must be thinking, well, wait a minute, what's happening here? Maybe this, you know, the oil industry that's in shambles and really it has, basically it's bankrupt um, and has no maintenance and, uh, and uh, it's, it's really in shambles. So what's the point of staying here, uh, going through all this situation, and we're not even getting the oil? Then I, I found that um, in response to that, um, Cuba had to, um, by the way, they receive about 100,000 barrels of crude of, uh, of Venezuela every day. And um, when, the, when the shipments stopped, they, uh, they were forced to go back to Russia and ask for, for oil. They had to go, of course, in a uh, rational mode in, uh, in Cuba. They had to... Um, to um, slash working hours, they most of the electricity had to be cut by half. They really were in in a difficult situation, similar to what had happened in early in the early nineties. So then, um, uh, last May, uh, Russia exported um, its first shipment of oil to Cuba. It was a tanker of two hundred and fifty thousand barrels of Russian oil. Uh, which is the first installment of 1.9 barrels uh, to be sent uh, by Russia into Cuba. So that makes you think, so the stake, uh, Cuba as a stakeholder of Venezuela, a major stakeholder, how are they going to handle this? When you also look at what Gustavo was saying, uh, the refineries are in a very bad shape. Many of them are working at less than 30% capacity. They have no maintenance. Basically, it's going to come up sooner than later. This whole thing will collapse. So what's the, the interest of Cuba at this point? Um, and that's an open question. Um, is it really that they want to establish communism there, or is it really that they want to profit from... Uh, from the Venezuelan oil. But to make things much, much more complicated, I think that you'd have to look also um, at other things that are happening in Venezuela, which is the connection with Syria, with Iran, and um, and obviously, as you know, the vice president is of uh, Syrian origin, and, um, and that brings another set of uh, variables that makes this whole thing very complicated to analyze and to predict at, at the end of the day. Um, I found a quote from the Wall Street Journal about uh, the Vice President El Aysami that said um, the following, one part master of Middle Eastern networking, one part honorary Cuban revolutionary, and one part highly ambitious Chavista. Mr. Ali al Saimi is a dream come true for Tehran and Havana. That makes him a powerful man in Venezuela. I think that summarizes um, a lot of what is the danger that we're looking at in, in Venezuela with all this connection uh, there. There are all sorts of reports uh, from foreign policy, from oil.com, from the uh, State Department, from the Justice Department, 
talking about the connections, um, the issuing of passports to terrorists in the Middle East, um, reports on uh, the drug trafficking, arms trafficking, I mean, all these sort of uh, wrong things that are, you know, we can list them. But um, I also found uh, something that I wanted to share with you that was uh, very interesting. It was, uh, uh, um, it was a, 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 a testimony at the... Um, at the House Committee of Foreign Affairs last year by Joseph Hamrai, a co-author co of uh, Iran's strategic penetration in Latin America. And he's the founder of the Center of Secure Free Society. And I extracted from the testimony, just to summarize uh, this very complicated, intricate um, relations with, with the Middle East. Over the years, El Aysami developed a sophisticated, multi-layered financial network that functions as a criminal terrorist pipeline, bringing militant Islamists to Venezuela and surrounding countries and sending illicit funds and drugs from Latin America to the Middle East. His financial network consists of close to 40 front companies that own over 20 properties in cash, vehicles, real estate, and other assets sitting in 36 bank accounts spread throughout Venezuela, Panama, Curaçao, San Lucia, Southern Florida, and Lebanon. This network became integrated with the larger Ayman Juma money laundering network that used the Lebanese Canadian bank to launder hundreds of millions of dollars and move multi-ton shipments of cocaine on behalf of Colombian and Mexican drug cartels, as well as Hezbollah. This immigration scheme is suspected all, to be also in place in Ecuador, Nicaragua, Bolivia, as well as some of the Caribbean countries. Um, and then there's still more and more reports of different sources. The point is that what we are looking here, um, and, and I'll try to just summarize this in a, in a sort of semi-conclusion, it's extremely complex with all the forces involved in, in here and to be able to predict what can happen. What one can say is that, is identify who are the stakeholders at this point. And it's not only uh, Maduro and his family, uh, but also it's the Cubans, it's the military, it's the militias that have been uh, beefed up, uh, created by Chavez and beefed up by, um, by Maduro. And, um, and all this loose-knit thing of, of the Middle East that um, we really don't know how much influence there's a lot or less into this. Um, I would say that the Cuban because of the influence that they have in the government, because of the, uh, the ideologic link with the uh, uh, Chavista government and Maduro uh, regime, I would think that um, I would put first on the list that Cuba will call the shots. How much is Maduro useful for them? Till when? We don't know. There's a big question mark for all of us, is why Chavez died. And there's whole speculation about that. Uh, he was treated in Havana. He put himself in the hands of the Cubans. Um, I read one time um, something that really struck me in one of those books that um, talked about the uh, the ship called Granma that left Cuba and went, uh, that left to Mexico, sorry, and went to Cuba. And it was um, overpacked with uh, guerrillas and uh, they faced a storm and they were always, they were almost uh, drowned. And at that point, the book says, or the legend says, that, um, that Che Guevara had an asthma attack. He suffered from asthma and he would go into this sort of special fits or like epileptic uh, fits. And, um, and the boat was drowning and then the book says and that at one point in time, Fidel said, we'll throw him out the board because, you know, we, we don't, this is, you know, excess weight and, and just we've got to get rid of him. And for some reason it didn't happen, but it struck that thing stayed in my mind, and making a, a loose association with what's happening in Venezuela is how, how useful are we as a country, a failed country with no oil, totally destroyed for the Cubans. 
And uh, that's the big question that I leave to all of you just to, to think of. Thank you. Begin now. Those who wish to ask a question, please raise the hand. I will kindly request a name and affiliation, and we'll begin with. Hello, my name's Nicholas. I'm an intern here at the Hudson Institute. Uh, it came up early that a military coup is unlikely in Venezuela. But it was also said that military officials increasingly play a role in government, and the military actually has uh, a source of income independent from the government through the criminal enterprises that they run. So would you say that a transfer of power to the military is already happening, and would that be in the interest of Cuba since the current regime isn't really working out for them? Who wants to take that question? Well, I, uh, <clears throat> as you mentioned, I don't think uh, the military coup, because when you see the case of Venezuela, remember, we're not talking about a government of four years or eight years or four years. We're talking about a government that had been in power for 18 years. That means is, and when the military in any country, when you analyze the behavior of the institutional behavior of the military, you see it's a potential for military coup. When the military is outside the problem, when the military is not part of the politics, and you know, in, in the case of Venezuela, it's totally different. The military is not an option. Why is not an option? Because the military is the problem. And they are so divided inside. They are the influence of Cubans, but they are divided inside. And what are the politics play by, by the case of Chavez and this government of Maduro? The, that you will be loyal to me, and I allow you to do whatever you want. You can get money, you can be corrupt, you can be in, in, well, in narco-trafficking activities, but you, for any reason, no, decide to break with me and not be loyal with me, I will put you and I will, if I need to kill you, I will kill you. If not, I would put you in prison. In other words, in the case of Venezuela, the military has been destroyed. You change the government tomorrow, and you need at least, at least three generations, and each generation of five years, and you have to why five years? Why not 10 years? Five years, because you need to five years to form and educate a military officer. And that's the, the reason. Don't see the military today in Venezuela as an, a military institution for exclusive dedication of defense of the homeland. No. They are involved in politics. They are involved in narco-trafficking. And they are, they are the convergence of narco-trafficking and terrorist activities. And the boss of that, as you mentioned before, is Mr. the Vice President of Venezuela. The convergence of narco-trafficking and terrorist activities. Hi, good afternoon. Alex Sanchez from, from Jane's Defense, and I also study at NDU, so it's great to see General Saavedra again. My question is for you. Um, you talked a little bit about um, the ideology that the military is receiving nowadays or for the past 20 years. Can you talk more about outside influences in the military training? For example, Cuba, you talked a little bit about that. Are Cuban instructors training military officers? Um, I also read about Venezuelan troops going to Bolivia to participate in that anti-imperialist school that President Morales has established in Bolivia. Are, um, have you heard anything about that? Is this really uh, happening? And my other question would be, President Chavez spent billions of dollars 
keeping his general, his admirals happy by buying weapons from Russia, from China. Is the current crisis affecting this kind of purchases? Has have, has Rudolf been forced to stop uh, acquiring weapons from these countries because he just doesn't have any money? Or are, still, are they still going on? Thank you. The, uh, and again, we need to see what is the relationship between the Cuban militaries and the Venezuelan militaries. Um, when you politicize the military, that go inside the mind of the military. In the case of Venezuela, Cubans, with the beneplacit of the Venezuelan government, have go inside the military and they have been transformed in the education, in the way to think. And that's the way how they act today. It's a Marxist-Leninist basic ideology, part of that. But in the case of Venezuela, it's even worse because it's not just ideology, how they act. They act also for corruption because they have been corrupt. Because the damage done to the military institution in Venezuela, that's my, my, my thought, is uh, that will take three or four generations. I'm talking about 20 years. And anything that you compare with other military in the region, last century, traditional military coup, in Venezuela is even worse. Because what you have is a regime, is a totally criminal regime. They don't care. They don't have any ideology. The military has no ideology. It's just business. The only remaining and hope that I can see inside the military, those that still believe that they need to follow the Constitution. It's a small group. But the others, they don't want to get involved. And the other one, they are so involved that I don't see other thing in the military. In fact, that's the reason why you see when the military raise the left hand and they say, I'm here to protect the revolution, not the homeland. That's, that shows you what kind of mentality, what the mindset that you have today in the military forces in Venezuela. Yeah. Yes, sir. My name is Wayne Young. I'm with Port of Harlem Magazine. And my question is, what were the conditions in the country that led to the situation now? That what led conditions were in the country that led to the situation now? That led to what? Led this situation. This. To this situation. Well, that's a long story. <laughs> but uh, but in, in a few words, in, in 1998, uh, the Venezuelans believed that uh, the democracy was doing such a poor job that they wanted a radical change from what they had had so far. From 1958 to 2000 or to, to 98, we had a, a, a deteriorating democracy. It was excellent during the first years and it became very poor during the last half or one third. So Venezuelans felt we are ready for change. The only thing that they forgot that change is not always for the better. And they chose Chavez. And Chavez in one year, in 1999, destroyed the whole democratic system. It eliminated the Congress. It, uh, it took over uh, tight control of decision making. And, and many Venezuelans gave him uh, uh, sign for uh, b uh, check in, uh, in uh, blank for him because they felt that he wanted to change radically the situation in, in Venezuela. But uh, it, it became progressively worse. Uh, he became a, 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 poop, a puppet of the, of the Cubans uh, because of his mm. idolatry of uh, Fidel Castro. And, uh, and the situation is now intolerable. Uh, it didn't come overnight. It didn't come magically. It was the very slow process of deterioration. Bahadur. I'm Javier Rupert, the former Spanish ambassador to Washington. Um, 
Well, well, listening to all of you, uh, the the feeling is that uh, you've reached Venezuela had reached a hopeless situation. Um, and, and one option, well, it's not an option, but one situation you didn't talk about is the possibility of a civil war. Is there any bad chance that uh, the civil war might eventually appear? That uh, being so intolerable the situation that uh, the opposition, all those people uh, going down to the street, decide to do something by force? You know, when, when you talk about civil war, you think of Syria in recent times, and then you look back uh, into, you know, the, the, um, the breaking up of... Uh, of uh, the whole socialist uh, camp and then the, the wars, the internal wars that came in the 90s. Um, and it's a very scary word, you know, scary um, uh, description. But I, I did mention the escalation, and I do think there's going to be a, a, a larger um, conflict that we have seen at, at this point. Um, how long can that last? We don't know. But definitely as of... August 1st or August 3rd, when the new National Assembly or the new the fraudulent Constitutional Assembly uh, takes goes in and takes over the and displaces the the old national uh, the co the Congress, we're going to see a large large escalation of of this. And um, how's it going to play out? It's very difficult. What we see is that the more repression that there is. The more people go out to the streets is not the contrary. It's more, um, especially the youngsters. And, uh, and you hear a lot of, uh, of um, you know, you hear a lot of them saying, you know, we rather die than live under communism. So we don't care. You know, we rather go out there and fight for what we believe, which is really heroic. Um, and uh, yes, the civil war, if you look at one side, you have the government and basically the National Guard that it used to be about 70,000 or 60,000 guards. Now they have beefed it up to 110, 120,000 of them. Then you have the militias that were originally 100,000 and then they have beefed it up to almost half a million of them. So you add up those numbers um, and then you have the rest, the, the army and the navy that have not been playing any role at all. What's going to happen to that? Nobody knows. They, some of them say that they have no arms anymore, that everything was concentrated in the National Guard. You know, there's a lot of speculation there. But you do see, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Venezuelans out on the streets willing to, to fight for this. And would that be qualified as a civil war? Um, it's, I would say that in a low intensity, I don't mean that, but it, you know, that the lives are not worth, but, but it's a full blown uh, um, civil war. It's, it's hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine, although um, if we have had in three months um, 100 deaths, uh, we might build up those 100 in a couple of weeks uh, after, after August, I would say. I just wanted to add uh, that uh, the situation in Venezuela is far from, from being hopeless. Uh, it would be hopeless if we didn't have the civic rebellion that we are having right now. Uh, finally, the country is marching against a government that is intolerable. You cannot tolerate such a government in Venezuela because if you negotiate in any way with these people, you are bound to repeat in a few years or a couple of decades the same situation that we have seen so far in these last 18 years. Uh, the new generation of Venezuelans are, is magnificent. These young people are magnificent. I, I for one, I, I am convinced that Venezuela will, will research, will resurrect, if you wish, from these 18 years of disaster. I want to clarify something. When I mentioned militias, it's not militias um, like it's paramilitaries, but on the government side. Those are uh, civilians that have been armed by the Chavista government. So it's that adds up to the National Guard. Um, I just want to make sure that that, that is clear. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Tristan Byrne with Capital Alpha Partners. Um, I think uh, around D.C. there's been a lot of talk in the past weeks about uh, imposing sanctions on, on oil. Um, but I think listening to you guys here today, uh, I want to look at um, sort of from the other side and how, how vulnerable is uh, PDVSA to the same sort of strikes that are going through the rest of the country? How vulnerable is PDVSA? Vulnerable is PDVSA to this strike coming. This mm -hmm. strike that called for today. To the embargo? Huh? To, to the, the, yes, to the embargo. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, actually, uh, for, for, for the U.S., there would be no problem whatsoever in limiting Venezuelan oil imports. There is a tremendous amount of oil in the global market. In fact, uh, uh, they would be, uh, it would be more of a problem for the, for the U.S. to stop exporting gasoline and diesel oil to Venezuela. Uh, very few people will know that uh, Venezuela imports 80,000 barrels per day of gasoline from the United States. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, Saudi Arabia importing sand uh, for the deserts. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason is because, as uh, Gabriela said, the, Vene the Venezuelan refineries are operating at 30 percent capacity due to mismanagement and lack of maintenance. So there would be no problem. Uh, the problem in, in, in this oil embargo, if you wish, is uh, that many Venezuelans believe that it would be counter, counter, counterproductive for the Venezuelan people because uh, Venezuela is living with the, fi with the five billion dollars they get from, in cash from the U.S. for their 700,000 barrels per day of oil they send to the U.S. Uh, I feel that uh, what is happening today, and I said it before, is that the, the government of Maduro is using that money in order to pay international debt, the bond debt, uh, rather than importing the food that the Venezuelans require. So uh, when, uh, when you stop uh, paying this guy, uh, Maduro, what you're going to have is a default by the Venezuelan government within the next uh, three or four months. They, they cannot live without this income. So I feel that uh, it's like going to, to, to a doctor, to a dentist, getting your tooth out is very painful, but it's more painful to have lived for 18 years with, 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 uh, with a toothache. And uh, we have been living for 18 years with a toothache because we refused to go to the dentist. And going to the dentist is what an embargo of oil would mean. Mm -hmm. To take a radical action about the whole thing. And it's time to do it. Uh, we cannot wait any longer. This morning I saw a photograph of 10 babies in one crib mm -hmm. in a hospital in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. Because the Venezuelan government has no money to pay for cribs. And yet, the mother-in-law of one of the ministers of the current government uh, had $42 million in a Swiss bank. Uh, the Swiss uh, confiscated this money, which is a rare occasion uh, uh, to celebrate. Uh, but you can imagine uh, the injustice of 10 babies in a crib and the mother-in-law of the minister with $42 million in her bank account. Um, I, don't, I don't want to diminish from that injustice, but um, just to, to clarify uh, my question, I was wondering about what the impact of a potential strike, the nationwide strike, it, like from a, from a Venezuelan people's initiative on uh, on PDVSA and, and it, sort of that conflict between Venezuelans that want oil production to continue um, versus those that might be best to stop it or most empowered to stop it, like the uh, uh, the engineers. Um, whether they might take action. Yeah, well, it's, it's very hard to imagine that PDVSA will be worse than it is right now. I think a strike on PDVSA would only accelerate uh, the, uh, the fall of, of Maduro, but it's not a critical factor in, 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 in it. I'd like to, excuse me, Jaime, just to you, Mr. Ambassador, you know what I see? Potential for the future, other than civil war? Rwanda. This is what I think. 
Okay. Rwanda case could be in Venezuela. Could be easy. Okay, because you are for civil war, you need to have two parts, two factions. In Venezuela now is ninety percent of the people in one side and ten percent in the other side. It's a little a small elite criminal, elite governing the country. With the weapons. Yes, and with the militaries, with the weapons, with everything. But it's a little a little part of that. And then in my personal opinion, what I see is a potential a situation like Rwanda. Herb Rose, um, I have a question, two questions. Uh, first, uh, although the Trump administration is only six months old now, have you noticed much of a difference between the Obama administration and the Trump administration as far as Venezuela goes. And uh, uh, secondly, you said that uh, uh, Mexico and uh, Canada have been more forceful in their uh, actions. Uh, in what manner have they been more forceful? Well, Canada and Mexico in, uh, within the OAS, uh, they, they, they are the ones, apparently, they, they are the leaders of this group uh, that mentioned, Ruben, about the 14 or 20 countries, uh, Mexico and Canada. Especially Canada has always taken the initiative because they are less cautious than the U.S. administration has been so far. And the Obama administration was really very passive. And that was, uh, you could see that in the behavior of Tom Shannon, who was uh, the, the man in charge of handling this affair of Venezuela. He actually, uh, up to the last minute, he was uh, calling for, for a dialogue that was a total uh, fraud that wouldn't lead to, to anything constructive. Uh, one of the very few things I like about Trump is that he, he sounds more positive or more forceful about Venezuela than President Obama did. Uh, but uh, he's um, threatening, actually, with, with this oil embargo that has everybody worried in Venezuela. Thank you very much. Um, the... Um, Today's Financial Times had an interesting column uh, on Venezuela, and one of the recommendations of the author who was at IESA in Venezuela was that there needs to be um, more diplomatic arm twisting, his words, I quote, uh, and that the the embassies, the governments of the region need to get their act together and walk the walk, as it were, um, is, uh, would it be helpful uh, in, in uh, reinforcing that arm twisting uh, to include Spain, the EU, other countries that might take an interest outside of just the the countries of the Americas and ex to express really the outrage at the direction that this government has gone in. And related to that perhaps, none of you have mentioned China, which in <laughs> fact played a very important role in making this Maduro government possible and viable, economically viable, etc. <coughs> what is to be done with China? Um, may I address that? Uh, okay, Margaret, uh, let me answer you the first one. Yes, I think uh, Spain need to play a major role. Uh, we have more than 200,000 <inaudible> Venezuelan <inaudible> Spaniards. <inaudible> that if something is getting worse in Venezuela, they will go to Spain, <coughs> Spain cannot say no because they are Spanish citizens. That's the case. I mean, Spain is very worried about that because having about 100,000 or more 
citizen coming to your country, you know, in short periods of time, that will create you a major problem, economic problem, unemployment, and all this uh, cascade effect. It's a one thing. Yes, and Spain has been active. And I remember the last summit in Germany, the, uh, uh, the prime minister from Spain, he was very active uh, with the Mexicans, uh, with the Brazilians in that summit, trying to bring something to the table about the case of Venezuela. Okay, this is the, uh, the first thing. And the, the, then the second question that you made is China. China. Yes, I remember, uh, we had the hemispheric uh, uh, external actors. And then you have China, India, uh, Russia, and they play a major role because today Venezuela is a major hub of the a sleeping cell of Jizbula. That's the one thing. And then you say China. Okay, China had nothing to do with this. Apparently, we never know. We, you know, <laughs> it's not, I, I don't want to say 100% that, but probably not. But it's more than $55 billion, the Venezuelan debt with China. And um, that make a major concern to China how to get, to get that money uh, in the future with another government. Yes, uh, the Chinese need to be contacted because same thing with the Russians, which is different, because it's a global effect of what happened in Venezuela. What I mentioned before, I didn't mention China, but China is just, they don't want to get very involved in politics and the regime change, but they have the concern about the economy and the major debt, because this is the major debt of any country in the Western Hemisphere with uh, China. Yes. And that's, that's the point. Yeah, just briefly, uh, though, uh, I think that, as I said in my, uh, my comments, uh, I think it is time to consider sanctions, you know, really, collectively or individually. You know, uh, countries can get together outside of the OAS or outside of the UN. The 14, the G14 can impose sanctions. I, I mentioned them, diplomatic, I, I, I gave a, a, a few options, but it is time. Now, the question is whether the government will you know, how effective will they be eventually, you know, will they, will they affect the population uh, or not, uh, and how badly, uh, or, or whether the government will budge and, and change course, will it, will, it, will it work? But I think it is time, it is time for countries to consider uh, sanctions. Uh, why not? Yes, I'd like to say something also to the Caribbean nations. We have uh, the Caribbean course now, and I talked to them uh, Monday about this issue. And I say, today, the Caribbean nations, the small island state, need to come up and say something, individually or the CARICOM. And they are so quiet. But the, the problem is they are in the corner because if they don't say anything, if something happens, what about the Venezuelan diaspora to the Caribbean, okay? And the drug issues. You know the numbers of boats and airplanes captured in those small island states with a lot of drugs coming from Venezuela? And they are suffering this. And I say, if you stay quiet, if you do nothing, you will suffer what happened in Venezuela. If you have the opportunity in this moment to come up and say, listen, we cannot tolerate this anymore. Because otherwise, they are going to be affected. Because the coming government in Venezuela would say, oh, right, you were the small island state. Because Petro Caribe is nothing new. Venezuela always had helped the small island state with oil, with good prices. But they are so quiet now, and then I told them, be careful, because if you don't do something now, then you will suffer. Same thing if you stay quiet. I don't see other way. They will be, either way, they will be affected. One final question. 
Oh, it's one thing. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the Venezuelan people are law-abiding, and they respect the rule of law. This situation that is happening in Venezuela didn't develop overnight, but it benefits someone. Someone is benefiting from this situation in Venezuela. Who is this someone who's benefiting from the situation in Venezuela? Is it, is it a nation? Like, whose best interest is it in to keep Venezuela in this situation? And I say it's in the best interest of the West to keep Venezuela in this situation. Am I correct? No. Well, then who? Who does it benefit? Um, let me let me get the, let me get the, the, that depends how you see it. But today you have in the international arena you have two actors: non-state actors and state actors. And we mentioned all of us. We have mentioned Cuba. We have mentioned uh, China. We have mentioned Russia, uh, Syria, and other countries that get some relation with what happened in Venezuela. But also keep in mind, I keep one eye in the non-state actors. I mentioned before, convergence of criminal activities with terrorists, the vice president of Venezuela, Mr. Diodao Cabello, just to mention two. But it's several key members of this government they are related to criminal activity. Venezuela is not uh, a an democracy in problem. It's no weak institution. It's criminal government. Okay. It's a criminal government committing criminal activities with the power of the government. This is what you get in Venezuela. This is the reality. That's my own uh, opinion. But we haven't seen this in the region before, when a government commit crime, an international crime. Actually, you have, uh, you have many, many mothers in law of uh, the ministers depositing their money in Switzerland. <laughs> uh, what, what you have uh, an oligarchy uh, that has made Millions. I, I, I have an estimate of $300 billion that have been transferred from the Venezuelans to the pockets of this oligarchy made up of the Chavez and Maduro members of the, of the gang. Uh, but uh, you also have uh, the, the countries that have benefited from the Chavez government, and they are ide ideological brothers of, of the socialist uh, or Marxist-oriented government of Chavez. Uh, you know, Iran, uh, North Korea, uh, Gaddafi's Libya. Uh, you have these collection of countries which felt that the, the Chavez government was a victory for their ideology. Uh, many of those guys are gone. Gaddafi is gone, Sadat is half gone, uh, I mean, uh, Hussein is gone. So, but, uh, but the ideological <laughs> part of the world that was uh, uh, close to the Venezuelan regime was the beneficiary of these 18 years. I'm talking monetarily. Uh, oil is going out. Oil. Oil. Unrefined is going out, and you sold back refined gasoline. That's the hub of your whole economy. That's the central focus of Venezuela's economy. It's oil. That's their major product that they have to sell the world. Mm -hmm. And you get back gasoline. Somebody is taking something off the top, off the middle, off the bottom, and under the table. Who benefits in that? No, no it's uh, no. all this happening is the product of the incompetence of the regime in Venezuela to do its work. The refineries in Venezuela were in excellent condition when Chavez came into power. Uh, I, I was uh, 
a witness to that. Uh, now they are running at 30% capacity, and uh, they are probably going uh, away, uh, I mean, in total disrepair. Uh, the, the only guilty party on this is, uh, is the Venezuelan regime. Uh, the, the amount of oil Venezuela is sending uh, to the U.S. Uh, is actually less than half of what they used to send to, Venez uh, to the U.S. before Chavez came into power. Uh, we used to export 100, uh, one million and, and a half barrels per day to the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the pre-Chavez era. Now we are exporting barely 700,000. Uh, who is responsible for that? I mean, the government in, in Venezuela. And for the U.S., this is a marginal business, uh, considering that the U.S. is, is now producing, uh, I think, 11 or 10 or 11 million barrels a day. Uh, is, uh, we are peanuts now. We are no longer an oil power. Uh, that's the unfortunate situation. Okay. We thank you very much for your attendance this afternoon. And why don't, why don't we close this with a nice round of applause to our...